Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. This is different. <laughs> it's loud. And yeah, you can probably hear <laughs> me. I am just in awe at what God has done. Welcome. To those of you that are online, thank you for joining us this morning. Those of you here in person, welcome. As you can see, we've got a whole different setup going on here. And it is so personal with God. I feel so connected this morning. And even through all the rushing, we, we, we came in early to make sure the lights were all turned right. And we were still working on trying to get some things at the last minute. But we're here. And we're ready to worship. Uh, just some things that are coming up this Wednesday. We will be uh, doing the second study in our Overcomer Bible study. So if you haven't joined us yet and you want to, meet us right here, 310 3rd Street Southeast on Wednesday at 7 o'clock for the second week of our Overcomer Bible study. And then next Saturday, more excitement. We're going to be running an orange track in here, <laughs> which will be awesome. And it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're looking forward to getting that all set up. And that uh, registration will be 9.30, races at 10, uh, barring any technical difficulties. If we have technical difficulties, we'll just push it back a little bit. No big deal. Uh, God's in control, amen? Amen. Yes, amen. Uh, well, this morning, Pastor Mark has chosen Philippians, 6, or Philippians 4, 6 through 9 as the verse for the call to worship. And... We just watched a movie last night called War Room. Mm -hmm. This fits so good. I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, uh, of and I cannot remember her name. Uh, Priscilla Schreier played the character. And when she was done, when she was over uh, her life being just overrun by Satan, and she walked through her house yelling at Jesus to get out, yeah. screaming. What's that? The devil. Yeah. yeah, the devil to get out. Get out. Get out. And, and that's what we need to do with our life. And, and that's what this, this passage really talks a lot about. Listen to Paul's words to the Philippians. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I'm going to stop right there because that's what this ministry does. Before we do anything, we pray. When we were praying to begin the ministry, it took us lots of prayer to come up with prayer care share ministries. And then when we decided to plant the church to come up with Grace Street Church. Do you know there's no Grace Street in all of the greater Cedar Rapids area? So that Grace Street actually comes through that door right there and right into this sanctuary. So we prayed about that. And then we prayed about where we would start meeting. And then we prayed about moving to someplace else. And then we prayed about having a space of our own. And what, two years worth of prayer on that? Start, stop, start, stop. But pray about everything. And this is what we did. And this is what Paul continues. He says, tell God what you need. And then thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. This is a passage that tells us that anxiety is not compatible with our faith in God. Paul's language here is very deliberate. It's, it's very inclusive. It, and there's no restrictions on applying prayer to our lives. And he's teaching us the importance of, of, of that practice of prayer. Remember in the movie last night, for those of you who said, um, how she struggled to even get 10 minutes of prayer when she started. And then we see the scene where she fell asleep in her prayer closet, in her prayer, in her war room. And they, they did turn it into a little bit of funny there where she went out to get the package and her hair was all over the place. And when she took when she started talking, 
delivery driver is like, ooh, let me use the brush. But it's so important, and, and, and prayer provides us an outlet for anxiety. And, and as I was saying about this, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. That's how important this is. God cares so much about us. And that peace of God is a direct answer to our prayer about anxiety. Now, in addition to praying about everything, Paul, Paul then, in the latter part of this passage, he, call, he calls us to live a life of obedience. We have to be obedient. And that, that starts with that prayer. And it, that obedience is by fixing our thoughts, as, he, as Paul says, fixing our thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. So we like the Philippians and can be guided by Paul's teaching and by his example. And Paul loved. And, and he's talking in love to the Philippians here. And, and, and we can expand that. He's talking in love to all of us, to all future generations that would read this letter. But what it boils down to is the peace of God depends on our obedience. So Father God, as we prepare to hear the message that you gave to Pastor Mark on overcoming anxiety with peace, we just ask for peace for him, Father. We pass, ask for healing, for relief from pain. And, and then as he comes up here to deliver this first message in this, this place, in this new space that you have given us, Father. We just thank you for uh, giving us a peace. Now, Father, we were anxious as we were trying to get everything done, but you provided us through prayer that peace, and we thank you for that. Now, Father, we pray a special blessing on Pastor Mark, and that his words would not only be heard, but that we'd be to truly listen to what you have to say through him to us, and that we would take it to heart. And apply it to our daily lives. Father, thank you for this message we are about to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you, Pastor Terry. Welcome, everybody, again. And uh, it's just awesome to be here today. It really is. Uh, it was kind of a challenging morning for me this morning, to say the least. Um, but God had to be in it. So I slipped and fell in the shower, and you probably noticed I've got a nice big knot on the front of my head here, skin missing. Uh, so I took a header right into the wall of the shower, and got a tile, a marble tile in the shower, and so I kind of sat there in the bottom of the tub going, oh. So I got up, and I was, got out of there, and got everything cleaned up and ready to come in and I must put on my pants and all of a sudden I just kind of went whoa and down I went backwards and hit the rocking chair with the back of my head so it was like you're not going to come here you're not going to give this message today so if I seem a little bit loopy today I've got reasons <laughs> no excuses but I've got reasons um, but it's absolutely wonderful here so but what really I thought was great was I had to go out and sit down for a while because my head was just loopy and I was really unstable. So, his wife told and, uh, <laughs> so I turned on the TV and Dr. David Jeremiah was on this morning and he was talking about fear. And he was uh, working through the book of Mark and he's going through a whole series on fear and overcoming fear, which is the next one that in his succession to the overcoming series that we're going through right now. And so as I sat there and I listened this morning and he was talking about the anxiety that the disciples had while they were out in the boat and he was at the peak of his ministry and, and crowds of people were just crowding in on him and he was exhausted because people were just zapping him and he was healing people and, and touching people and his strength was, was waning. And so they put out into a boat and went out into the lake and I'm sure you know the passage in Mark that I'm talking about. But the disciples were full of anxiety and they were full of fear and he was talking about those kind of things and I was going hey that's my message today and he said you know he didn't tell the storm to go away he didn't tell the storm 
to stop. He called it out. He rebuked it and told it to have peace. And instantly, a calm fell over the water. And it fell over the disciples. And this was not just an ordinary storm that blows in. This was a storm. And if you look at the words that they had in, in Greek uh, that they translated in there, one calls it a hurricane and the other one calls it an earthquake in water, which nowadays we call a tsunami. And so this was a storm, or what we term today a perfect storm. And so this was not just anything that he rebuked and he told it to have peace instead. And a calm fell over. And so I, I, I kind of want you to hang on to that because that's what I got this morning as I was going through things and I think he was trying to get my attention that, hey, <laughs> use other ways. Um, so this is our third installment of our Overcomer series from Dr. David Jeremiah. And I have some thought questions for you today and, and kind of reorient ourselves. Well, we've got a coat rack out here if you need to hang your coats up. I've got sermon notes and some pens over here. I've got some word search puzzles if you guys want to have some fun this morning. Um, and I'm not sure what happened because that was working last night. I'll have to take a look at it this morning. But we have hot water dispensing in there, so if you want to make tea, we can make tea and cold water, chilled water as well. So we got a lot of new things and some fun things going on. Um, I've got to get the water dispenser to, to work here, though. So, But in our third series in here, it's overcoming anxiety with peace. And I thought that was awesome because he had that. So I have some thought questions for you today, and I, I kind of want you to, as I go through the message today, to think about these things and then try and answer them to yourself as we come through. Number one is, how are you praying? And, and Pastor Terry talked about it. We had that awesome movie last night that showed us, that showed us the power of prayer and how it changed lives. It changed families. It took them out of the bad situations they were in by submitting themselves to God and turning to prayer instead and letting God take over. So how are you praying? That's number one. Number two, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? And we'll cover that as we go through. Who are you following? And with social media, you know, you got all these things with Instagram. I don't pay attention to those things, and Twitter, I really don't get involved, and if you notice lately, I haven't even been on Facebook making many posts, but who are you following? And I, I really want you to think about that, <clears throat> because in this digital world, in this information superhighway age that we have in here, we're constantly bombarded by all this stuff. So who are you following? And then lastly, the, the last point I want you to think about this morning is, where are you living? Where are you living? So as we explore God's words today, I want to see if you can answer some of those questions. So I think we should start off by saying to overcome something, it move, means that we must move beyond where we are at. It means that we are meant to stay in place. And I mentioned that when I was talking about the 23rd Psalm a couple of weeks ago when uh, I was doing the call to worship with Pastor Terry. And, you know, in the 23rd Psalm, it, it tells us that, Yea, though I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. And we need to hang on to that, because we're not meant to stay in those dark places. And, and the valley of the shadow of death is an actual place, and it's in the bottom of a steep canyon. And the walls are so high that it only gets two hours of sunlight per day. That's it. Other than that, it is dark down in the bottom of that canyon. And they call that place the Valley of the Shadow of Death because you feel alone and chilled and it doesn't warm up down in there. And it's not a friendly place. It's not a friendly place. But see, we're not meant to stay in that dark place. We're meant to move through it. We're meant to overcome that darkness and move on beyond it. 
and we need to move on to something better, something more positive. That's what God wants in our lives. Otherwise, it's going to take us over, and we will be trapped in prison within that. And we find ourselves in that, in that area. And when we're talking about anxiety, um, we, we feel trapped at times. We feel trapped, and, and it can lead to panic attacks, and it can lead to a lot of different things. So anxiety is a heightened state of anxiousness, a feeling of wor uh, real worthy, nervousness, unease. So I kind of want you to get a grasp on those things. Typically, it's about something that is imminent in our lives, either an event or with an uncertain outcome that we're not sure of what's going to happen. But see, the problem with anxiety, left unchecked, uh, it can manifest itself physiologically in our bodies. And we know that because if you've ever had a panic attack, it can take you over it. I mean, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling. It can give you shortness of breath. And, tightness in your chest, you think you're having a heart attack. And a lot of people go to the hospital just to find out that they have high anxiety or a panic attack going on. So it, it can manifest itself physiologically and mentally, and it can get you trapped, trapped in that state. And it takes a lot to get out of it. Um, some people get so trapped into that, it becomes what's called a mental disorder in there and it's called depression. And if it gets bad enough, it becomes manic depression. And it needs to be treated and you need to get some professional help to get you out of that dark area to be able to overcome that anxiety and head towards peace in your life. Because anybody that knows it, that if they have compulsive anxiety attacks or panic attacks and that high stress that comes along with it, they are at anything but peace in their life. They have no peace. I like to, to kind of go back to that. Uh, years ago, there was a bumper sticker that you used to be able to get, and, and I had one on the back of my little truck at the time. And it says, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And really and truly, that's what this message today is about, is that without Jesus in our lives, if we don't submit these problems over to God and we, we hold them, we internalize them, we trap them within ourselves, then it builds anxiety. It builds that dark place that we need to overcome and get to something much more positive. So, if we take a look at the world around us today, it's a prime example of why we would have anxiety, right? Absolutely. So we might be really, really tempted to become very, very anxious based on the world that we live in today. And we take a look at that and we, we tend to say, well, you know, uh, we really don't have all that many problems that they didn't have 2,000 years ago. But the biggest difference is, is that it comes blasting at us. Social media, news outlets, 24-hour news stations, you name it, it just comes pouring on the internet. And a lot of it is misinformation. So you really have to be careful about, you know, what you listen to, what you read, all those kind of different things. And radio nowadays, you got to really filter things out really good. And so you've got a lot of the Christian stations out there. When I was in Savannah last week, I was really impressed. They have 10 different Christian music stations on the radio out there. 10 of them. You got your choice. You get bored of this one, you go over this one. But they have stations out there that have nothing but preaching 24 hours a day. And you look at the culture out there, and I, when I was in Tennessee, I think I mentioned that. You know, even the young kids, they go to church because they're brought up that way. They're brought up in the church. And everybody I talked to went to church. And there's churches everywhere out there. I love to see that happen in Cedar Rapids. And I think we have an opportunity to reach other people. It was fun when I came in. I was sitting in the window out here this morning after I carried stuff in. I was just kind of trying to collect myself again. And I 
this young lady came by and she she came and looked at our window and she was watching the TV and she watched it roll through and then she looked over at me and she gave me a smile and, and waved and walked on down the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. See, it doesn't take a message like we're giving right now to kind of reach people and plant a seed. They can come by and kind of take a look and they'll think about that. They'll see it, it'll implant themselves in their mind and hopefully then they'll want to get a little bit curious about it maybe come and see us and, and see what's going on. But life may have the same number of uncertainties that it had a long time ago, but we're being faced with all of this stuff hitting us all day long, all the time. And the problem with that siege that we're under is that we're faced with all the wrongs in the world. That's a lot of negativity coming through. There's very, very few positive things that we find coming through the internet. So, you know, Pastor Terry and I, we, we do this as much as possible. I know the rest of you do too. But we try and post something positive out there to overcome a lot of that negative that's out there, and, and during the political season, man, you know, I just had to quit watching. I couldn't watch the news, couldn't do any of that because it got to me after a while. I just couldn't stand it anymore because there was so much misinformation. There was so much wrong out there, so much injustice. And the problem with all that is, is that uh, it all leads to discord, and discord leads to anxiety. We can't help but be inundated, overwhelmed by all that information pouring out at us. It's hard to process those things through and get us to where we need to be. So all of these things together can make anyone anxious, upset, and at times consumed with a feeling of helplessness, trapped in a what-if world. Hang on to that thought. Trapped in a what if world. And what I mean by that is, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, we, we get that game and we, it just kind of takes us over. And, you know, what if this? You know, what if I lose my job next week? What if this happens? Or what if that happens? And we start living our lives in a what if situation. And in that time, we, we feel that we're a a victim of, help, of circumstances and we're absolutely helpless. And mostly, if we think about it, it's actually a state of emotion that we get ourselves into. And it's easily swayed by the perceptions of a given circumstance that we, we have to be facing at that point in time. Just a simple given circumstance. So I have a question for you. In any given circumstance, are we really helpless? We feel that way. We have the emotion of helplessness. We feel trapped within that circumstance or that perceived circumstance. But are we truly helpless at any given point in time? So I'd say if this is happening to you, you may need to stop and take a time out. Parents, you know what that's all about? Kids out of control, give them time out. Now, my parents used to make me go and stand in the corner, and they'd wake me up you know, a little later on, and I'd be in the heap on the floor in the corner. So I always had a really good nap, probably what I really needed at that time. But we need to take that time out. We need to ask ourselves, if the thing that I fear most was to happen, what could I do? Now I can ask that a different way too. If the thing that I fear most was to happen, what could I do? Huh. A little different spin on it. See, and that's going to allow you to turn it into a, from a what if situation into an if what situation. Huh. Well, Dr. Gregory Jantz wrote a book and he tells us all about this, the what-if world. And it says, what if a worldview concentrates on what isn't possible? So a what-if view, worldview, concentrates on what is, isn't possible, or what's not possible. And an 
if what worldview concentrates on what is possible. In other words, you go from that feeling of helplessness of what can I do to hmm, what could I do? And that really turns the situation around. It reverses that feeling or that path that we're going to take of anxiety and taking it out of that emotional state of a negative emotion and putting it into a positive state or a positive emotion instead. For example, your anxiousness is about losing your job. So then you have to look over the facts, such as your last performance evaluation if you uh, get those things. You have to calculate the odds of being let go. So if you had a really good positive performance evaluation, your odds of getting let go should be fairly minimal, right? So even though your reviews were good and the likelihood of being fired was minimal, anxiety will overshadow logic. It'll overshadow the facts. It'll look right on me on them. And anxiety says to you that the sky is falling. Anxiety is going to tell you that that the sky is going to fall, it's going to be really tragic, it's going to be really bad, we won't be able to pay our bills, we won't be able to do any of these things. And we kind of saw some of that in the movie last night. I, I wrote this a week ago, by the way. And so you take a look at those things, and in a what-if world, it's going to be, you know, what's going to hit me next? Where, when's the other shoe going to drop? What's going to happen to us? But at the same time, if we were to look at it objectively instead of subjectively, you may be surprised that the answer is the sky isn't really falling. The sky isn't really falling. Plenty of people have lost jobs only to find new jobs with better pay, better benefits, new opportunities, and guess what? It was a better deal than the job you left. So what if tells you it's going to be really bad, and an if what says, no, rethink things, it could be better. It could be better. Well, what if I found a new job with better opportunities, better pay, better benefits, better life, less stress? Ooh, hey, I'll take it. So we have to take a look at how we view our circumstances in life. We can either take a path that's going to lead us to anxiety by focusing on the what ifs of the world and all the negative things, or we can take that if what path to positive results and getting that peace back in our lives. So I want you to think about that today. And we have to learn to move from subjective thinking, just looking at the subject itself, into an objective thinking, or, hey, what if all this stuff could happen? What if I could do all these things? I like to say it a different way, and, and Lori kind of chuckled when I passed this by her the other day. It's taking us from stinking thinking to possibility thinking. See, that stinking feeling that stinking thinking that we get trapped into, it's exactly that. It leads to nothing good. It leads to nothing positive in our lives. So we have to be objective about things and look at if what? You know, what is God going to do next in my life? Because that's really where we need to be. And when we were watching that movie last night, I was sitting there going, hey man, this is what it should be. And what was, she, what was she telling her? She was telling her that she was trapped within her own problem. And she was actually building her own prison. And that imprisoned life was not a good life. It was, a, it was battles that she wasn't winning. And she never would win. And the same thing goes with anxiety. You're fighting battles that you could never win. If you're worried about everything continuously, Bible says, don't worry, right? Matthew 6, 25 through 34 says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink, enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food 
Isn't your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your Heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more, far more valuable to Him than they are? Hmm. Can all your worries add up to a single moment in your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work. They don't make the clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory wasn't dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he certainly will care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own wings. Today's trouble is enough for today. So in this passage here, we find Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he was teaching the people a completely different message than that which the Pharisees had been teaching them all along. False teachings, teachings that they were meant to keep the people down and under their control. Let's take a look at some of the points that Jesus wanted the people to take home with them. He wanted them to go home with a few things. And it really comes down to seven different reasons on why not to worry. Why not to go down that path? And why to have faith and trust God that he's got your back. He's got your front. He's got all of you. Absolutely all of you. So it comes down to this. Matthew 6, 25. The same God who created life in you can be trusted with the details of your life. The same God who created you can be trusted with the details of your life. Number two in verse 26. Worrying about the future hampers your efforts for today. How are you going to live the life that God gave you to live for today if you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. You lose sight of what's going on today. You miss all of the possibilities that God had, all of the opportunities that God had for you for that day. You blew it because you're all worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And you're so concentrated on that, you miss all the blessings that he has for you today. And get trapped in that negative view. Point number three. Verse 27. Worrying is more harmful than helpful. Worrying is more harmful than helpful. Alright, I have a question to ask. Because I, I, I just want to know. Has anybody ever here been helped? By worrying about something? You guys? Nobody? Okay. Nobody's ever been helped by worrying about a situation. Ever. Ever. So Jesus is saying, worrying is more harmful than helpful. 28 through 30. Point number four. God does not ignore those who depend on it. God does not ignore those who depend on it. When we heard in the movie last night, you got to submit to God. you got to let go of all these things and depend on God. Let Him work the stuff out in your life. That's what He's here for. He created you. Now let Him do His work. Submit to Him. Listen to Him. How do we do that? How do we talk to God? Oh, prayer. We have to get down. We have to make time for God in prayer. 
Make time for God in prayer. So point number five in verses 31 through 32. Worry shows a lack of faith and understanding of God. It shows a lack of faith. He says, why do you have so little faith? Remember the disciples in the boat when they were going through that storm in Mark and he was talking to them and he said, why do you have so little faith? Or if you want to go back to King James Version, oh ye of little faith. Don't you understand? I'm in control. I'm still on the throne. I'll be on the throne tonight. century after that God will still be on the throne we have to trust and understand that God had our lives planned out before we were born he knows every inch of us every hair on our head he's got counted we have to understand that God has a plan for our life we have to submit to that plan because he wants to have have us have a life that is a fulfilled life. The term do not fear is the most quoted term in the entire Bible. God says, hey, this is important. Quit worrying about fear. Fear is the tool of the devil. Fear is the tool of the devil. Peace, love, faith are the tools of find out that you get the job done best by using the right tool for the right job. Point number six, verse 33, just so you guys can keep track. Worrying keeps us from the real challenges that God wants us to pursue. And I kind of talked about this a little bit. If we're so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, we miss out on the opportunities possibilities and the blessings that God has for us today. Today. So worrying is really destructive. Anxiety is really destructive. That's that fear coming in that's replacing our faith. Point number seven, verse 34. Living one day at a time keeps us from being consumed by worrying about the future. Living one day at a time keeps us from being consumed about worrying about the future. What is yet to come? So he was teaching a message of peace, but not just any peace. He was teaching a message about internal peace. How to be at peace with ourselves. How to make peace with ourselves. A calmness in our soul. That sounds pretty good to me. That sounds really good to me. Better than that dream. So even though the world seems to be consuming everything in sight, very chaotic, very stressful, and we're under that 24-7 attack, can you follow these seven points to inner peace? Inner peace in the midst of the storm. Jesus, when he was out in the boat and this storm was pounding in and the waves were coming over the boat and it was taking on water and the disciples were just frantic. And he says, have peace. Have peace. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the chaos, are you concentrated on the chaos? Or are you concentrated on the person who controls? At a single word, he says, peace, and the storm subsides. But we have to trust in him first, and we have to go to him first in order to get that peace. So we have to choose to have a different perspective. We have to look objectively at any given situation, and we have to choose that different perspective. We have to choose to have faith in the face of fear. Choose God over circumstance. 
Choose God over circumstance. Live by faith, not by sight. sight. Do you understand how absolutely true, how absolutely important that verse in the Bible is? To live by faith and not by sight. It says, don't worry about these things that's coming at you. Full blast all the time. If you had yourself centered in faith, centered on a loving God, you'll have that peace. You'll have a peace that passes all understanding. The Word of God is a great thing. You have to get into it. You have to understand it. You have to know it. But more importantly, we have to live it out. We have to live by faith and not by sight. Ephesians 6, 13 through 16 says, Therefore put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in time of evil. Then after the battle you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all these things, hold up that shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. In the Overcomer series that we're going through with Dr. Jeremiah, he says, uh, tells us in the study that what we need is peace, and we are blessed to learn that peace is part of that Christian's spiritual armor. Stand there for having shot your feet in preparation of the gospel of peace. So a little bit, bit different interpretation than what I gave you there. I like what the NLT says. Stand your ground, putting on that belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news. So that you will be fully prepared. So as that junk comes at you, as the chaos of the world comes at you, as you're getting barraged by all this bad news... You've got something there that you can stand firm with. You can stand firm on the promises of God, on God's word, that he will be there for you, and he has a future plan for you, and it's better than all this junk that's coming at you. See, the Roman soldiers back in the day, their shoes were akin to those of, of modern football cleats. The shoes that they wear when they're playing football. They had metal cleats in the bottom, and they were built for traction, for standing firm in the midst of a battle. In the midst of a battle. Meaning, the metaphor that is God's peace is what gives us traction and stability in the midst of the attacks from the enemy. Fear is Satan's biggest and best weapon, and we take it on so easily. But God says, stand firm. Have that firm footing, stand firm, have that foundation of faith that overcomes fear. And that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are being assured that the peace of God will see us through any of the tribulations of the world that we might be able to face. In John 14, 27, it says, I am leaving you with a gift. I am leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart and the peace I give you is a gift that the world cannot give so don't be troubled or afraid don't be troubled or afraid it's a gift that we are given so as we said before we said this many times in our messages if you're given a gift what do you do with it do you put it on a shelf and say wow that's a cool gift and you leave it sit there you open it up and you look at that gift and you marvel at how wonderful that gift is and you take that gift and you use it right so when they hear it's saying I am giving you a gift of peace of mind and peace of heart and the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give through all of the junk through all of the social media through all of these things that cannot give you a piece of heart or a piece of mind. It gives you just the absolute opposite. It gives you a what-if world filled with anxiety, filled with fear. Wow, who wants that? 
How much of a gift is that? It tells you that Satan doesn't give good gifts. God gives good gifts. God gives good gifts. The end result of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is to build a deep and lasting peace. Unlike worldly peace, which is usually defined as the absence of conflict. How do you like that one? That's the actual definition of peace. That's the way the world looks at it. But we're just not in conflict right now, so we're in a time of peace. No, peace is this gift that we get from God. I'd rather look at it that way. I don't want the conflict. I don't want to participate in it. See, and I think that's a lot of what the world is doing today is they're getting so wrapped up in all this junk and people firing all these things out and posts on social media. And I know I seem to like to bash on social media, but it's the same as the news, newspapers, TV, radio, whatever you want to get barraged with today, most of it is negative, most of it's bad news. And see, it is so easy to get a hold of them nowadays. Satan makes it easy to get a hold of things that's gonna build anxiety and fear. He wants us trapped in that realm of his because then he has control over you. But instead, let's submit to God first. Let's have faith over fear and have that peace, that gift of peace that God gives us. So the end result of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, if we have that faith, is deep and lasting peace, unlike worldly peace. This peace is confident of an insurance in any circumstance. See, that peace, that gift that God gives us, we have confidence. In the face of circumstance, we have a confidence. We stand firm. Because we have our faith built on the good news of the gospel of Christ. With Christ's peace, we have no need to fear the, the present or the future. Sin and fear and uncertainty and doubt and numerous other forces are at war within us. When we talk about the spiritual warfare, we are getting barraged by all these things. And if we allow that to come in, and if we take that in and we're constantly surrounded by a negative influence, guess what? We start living a negative life. We submit to that instead of submitting to God. The peace of God goes into our hearts and lives to restrain these hostile forces and offer comfort in place of the conflict. Jesus says he will give us that peace if we were willing to accept it from him. So if your life is full of stress, allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with Christ's peace. I'll call to worship that way I picked this for this morning was Paul's letter to the church in Caesarea Philippi and it's Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, one final thing, if that wasn't enough, that was the answer to all the problems they were facing. One final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Do you find any negativity in any of those things? No, fix your thoughts on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the peace of God will be with you. How much more needs to be said? That's a sermon in itself. But it's so simple instructions. 
How many of us in here fail to obey it? Yeah, pretty sad. My NLT study notes give some really good insights into the chapter. And it says, how do we stay true to the Lord? And the way to stay true is to keep our eyes on Christ, to remember that this world is not our home, and to focus on the fact that Christ will bring everything under his control. Staying true means steadfastly resisting the negative influences of temptation, false teaching, persecution. Don't lose heart or give up. God promises to give us strength of character. With the Holy Spirit's help and with the help of fellow believers to stay true to the Lord. So we, we have to hold each other accountable. If we see a brother or sister slipping away and starting to go down a bad path, we really don't want that for them. If we truly love them as a brother and sister in Christ, we don't want them to go down that dark path. We don't want them to stay in that dark place. And here it's telling us that we need to step in and to help them, not to rebuke them, not to tell them all the things that they're doing wrong, but to say, hey, there's a better way. Let's get you back on the right path, the light path, back to Christ. It's not ours to judge them. It's not our place. But it is our place and our responsibility that we are given by the Word of God in here to go and help them along the way, to edify them, to build them up in the Spirit. That's part of our calling. That's part of what we are instructed to do. And it continues to say that it seems strange that a man in prison would be telling a church to rejoice. But Paul's attitude teaches us an important lesson. Our inner attitudes do not have to reflect our outer circumstances. Our inner attitudes don't have to reflect our outer circumstances. Paul was full of joy because he knew that no matter what happened to him, that Jesus Christ was with him. Was with him. And see, several times in Paul's letter, he urged the Philippians to be joyful probably because they needed to hear it in a time of getting blasted by so many negative things. We need to hear positive things. We need to hear to be joyful. So when I start off a message and I say, this is the Lord, day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is because we need to be thankful. We need to be joyful. We need to rejoice that we got another day to live. We got another day to live in God's presence and to live out His blessings in hope and in joy and in love and in peace. So if you haven't been joyful lately, you might not be looking at life from the right perspective. Where do you live? Now, not geographically. I mean, where do you choose to focus on in your life? Are you focused on those things that drive us to the destination we want to get to? See, we can either live in the past, live in the present, or we can live in the future. So are you living in the shadows? Are you living in the light? Are you living in the shadows? Or are you living in the light? If you're living in the past, you're allowing that past to drive your future. The past is over. Leave it there. I can't tell you anything more important than that because the past is the past. That's why it's called the past. You can't go back and change it. There's no magic time machine. I don't care what Doctor Who says. I don't care what Back to the Future says. There is no magic time machine. The past is the past. Let it go. Let it go. So the past is over. If you're worried about the 
the future, you're worried about something that hasn't even come to pass yet. So if you're worried about what your future is going to be like, don't worry about it. When we had the flood of 2008, Pastor Linda Bibb gave us a great message, and she did an interview in the newspaper, and she said, you know, we don't have to worry about what's coming in the future, because they were asking her, are you, are you afraid of what's going to happen in the future? She says, I don't have to worry about the future, because God is already there. God is already there. Those are words of wisdom that you can live by. Don't worry about the future. God is already there. Live for the present because that's what you need to live in right now. That's where you are. You can't live for something that happened before. You can't live for something that hasn't come to pass yet. Live for the present. Do what God is asking you to do. Submit to God. Receive those gifts. Receive the blessings that he has for us each and every day. And then you don't even have to worry about the future. He already has a plan for us anyway. We should all be living in the present. It will determine the course of our future. You have the ability to change your direction. You have the opportunity to make a new future. And here's the key. If God is at the controls of life, be assured he won't steer you wrong. With God in control, you don't need to be anxious about anything. Because he's already there. I suggest you let Jesus take the wheel. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that you give us this opportunity to gather freely and openly and to just just lavish your word all around us. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you give us each and every day, for these gifts that you have given us. Lord, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, for the word that you have written down for us, the paths that we should follow. Thank you for sending us reminders of where we need to be, what we need to do, what we need to concentrate. You have it all written down in your pages, Lord. Just help us follow it. Give us that strength and understanding to do your work and will in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mark. Gives us a lot to think about, a lot to pray about, and a lot to live for. You know, it's interesting as I, as I listened to the message this morning, um, I was drawn to, right back to 1 Corinthians 11, right where Paul is giving us the order for the Lord's Supper. Because in, in here, in verse 23, he says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. Paul could put this in front of any single thing he wrote. Anything that we have in the scriptures. He could have put that because that's what he did. He put it before us just because that's what he got from Christ. And, and hit the way that he got it from Christ, Paul was at his lowest. He was out there. He was persecuting Christians. He was on his way to Damascus. He was going to arrest some more Christians and maybe even take them back to Jerusalem to their death. But God stopped him in his tracks and he changed it. And so... He says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues, says this, he took the cup and in the same way he
took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And Paul adds, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So this morning, as we share this meal together, think about the things that are causing anxiety in your life, things that are causing stress in your life, things that are, are getting in the way of you having joy. Give them to God. Because we can't my wife, I can't change Mark, I can't change any of you. I can't change anybody out there. I can only deal with myself, and I put it to God, I let him do the rest of the changing. So as we eat this bread, let go of this cup. Do some remembrance of what Christ did for you on the cross. He took away your sin. He caused you to change. Father, we pray right now that we would give things over to you. We would turn those things that are, are clogging up our life, whether it's finances, whether it's relationships, our marriage, our children, our jobs. And we turn them all over to you, Father. Because we can't control any of it, but you have control. You are the sovereign God. And we give them to you, Father. And right now we pray for everyone who is with us online and everyone that is with us here on campus. But Father, we also pray for the folks that have not tuned in online yet or who have not walked through the front doors yet. And Father, let us be a beacon of light to them. And not just them, Father, but as we leave this place today, let us be a beacon of hope and of your love within our families, within our friends, within our workplaces. And anywhere that we come into contact with your children. Father, we thank you and praise you and honor you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name.
I'm just in awe of that. And I just feel that this church is going to be just like that. I feel that we can say, just even if it's just one person at a time, we can be here to be um, prayer warriors for those and stand in the gap for others. And so before I continue, does anyone else have <laughs> any prayers or any thoughts of any God sightings this morning? So anyway, all right. Well, Father God, we come to you in awe this morning. You are such a great God. And we just want to worship you. I pray that you will raise this church up. And you will raise up each and every one of us to be prayer warriors for others. To stand in the gap for others who need help, who are in trouble or are just worried or, or need a friend, Lord God. Help us to love on each other and just to do your will. Let us be your hands and feet as Grace Street continues. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for each and every one of us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, this brings us to our close of our online portion of our service today, and we thank you for joining us, and we invite you back again. If you'd like to join us in person down here at our new digs, uh, we'd be honored and happy to see you here with us. So let us go to God in prayer and close this out. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. And thank you that you hold the keys over death. That by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan that you made a way for us. We confess today our need for you to refresh us and to make us new again. We ask that you renew our hearts and our minds and our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us and help us to keep focused on what is pure and right Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we have been, sending his lies and attacks our way, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you, and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you will be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear and removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls. Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us to be a light to our world. May we make a difference in this world for your glorious purposes. Set your way before us and make all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gifts. To you be the glory and honor on this day and forever. 